Hello again, this is Ron Matson. Welcome to the Executive Briefing Room here at uh, the River Lodge in Reparoa, New Zealand. I'm joined with Chuck Missler. Hi, Chuck. Nice to be with you, my friend. Oh, it's, uh, it's our, we've just gone through the shortest day of the year for us in the Southern Hemisphere. The which longest is, night, right? The longest <laughs> night and the longest day up in the Northern Hemisphere. But, uh, and we did it without any, uh, anything to be concerned about. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No, I'm doing fine. Doing yeah, fine. good, excellent. Well, I want to tell our viewers just a couple of things before we get into the Q&As. One is, we often have people write us emails or contact us by various methods asking, how can I help? They love the ministry. They love to see what's going on. And I would say, very simply, do this as you see it on the screen. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is Cornelia House. By doing so, it allows us to be able to send you notices of every video that we load. Plus, if you are... Um, a user of Facebook or Twitter, uh, also we have a presence there. You want to uh, take advantage of those, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, by subscribing is the quickest and easiest way for us to be able to communicate with you what's uh, coming and for you to be able to communicate with us. Secondly, what we'd like you to do is after you subscribe, then use the features there if you see a video or something <coughs> that you like. What we'd like you to do is hit the like button and share it. Take the video, share it through Facebook. If there's a particular part of it that's uh, important to you or something that you'd like more discussion on uh, with the people that you're connected with. And lastly, give us feedback. We do listen uh, to the feedback that comes through uh, both our YouTube channel and our Facebook uh, uh, remarks uh, and comments. Uh, we take notice of of what's taking place and we shape uh, these programs based on uh, the interest that we see there. So, well, we, And we, we get a real pickup from that encouragement. It is really and good, people, isn't it? People write us little notes and so forth. It's clear that they're watching and they're value what we do. Uh, that kind of encouragement is scriptural. That's what you should be doing. Yes. Are, yeah. Barabbas or whatever. Yeah, that's right. No, exactly right. And so well, we Barnabas, certainly have this. Yeah, no, not yeah. Barabbas, right? <laughs> We got those guys. We have some of both, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I also want to just make note of the fact that um, we have a conference coming up in October. Uh, it's the Strategic Perspectives Conference. It's our international conference. It's in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, at the Coeur d'Alene Resort. Uh, if you have not been to it, you'll want to attend, especially given this 2016 is such a tumultuous year. It's a lot of change, a lot of things that are going on, and we'll be looking at uh, current affairs through the biblical perspective. And so if you want to find out more about that, just go to our primary uh, website, which is Koinonia uh, House, which is khouse.org. Um, and uh, so you want to check that out. And if they're stateside, be there. We, this is one of the times that we try to arrange our travel to be stateside. Correct. Uh, for, for a good part of the month, actually, but yes. especially near the end of the month with our big conference. Yes, yes. Well, Chuck, let's move on to the very first question. It's going to deal um, with really people who are asking the question with how do they know what the Lord is saying? And here's the question. I'm seeing so many people in religious circles, people who are sincere, who testify that they have prayed to God to know the truth of the rapture and have been answered by God that the, by, that the bride of Christ will go through the 70th week of Daniel. Others claim to have prayed to God and gotten a different answer. Why all the collective confusion? Well, I don't know why there's confusion, but uh, we don't know the you know, uh, uh, t time in the day. The people who feel they've gotten that are, are arguing really against the, the weight of Scripture. And so uh, we don't know when it's going to be. Mm. Uh, we don't pretend to know where we're... And uh, uh, people who feel that they know that are are either mm. getting a very special revelation uh, or they're just kidding themselves. I, I, I don't think it's the Lord's intent for us to know that in advance. Mm. But I think the question really that's being asked, though, is not only about people who can say, I got a, a, a vision that it's going to be, you know, April the 15th or whatever. But also, I think the question that's being asked here is the question of what do you do with people who say, I prayed about that doctrine or that understanding and God revealed to me that this is true or that's true. 
Um, how? How did he reveal it? Ah, the that's the question, exactly. I mean, I, I, uh, when we were preparing for this, this program, I sort of looked at things. Uh, uh, for example, the, uh, the idea of, of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, all Scripture... You know, I want to get uh, this a little more ahead. clearly. Go ahead. Uh, you studied that and got prepared for this in you advance. Didn't tell me what you're, what you're telling me is you're catching me cold, and that's fine. But but you you peeked ahead and did a little preparation. I want them to understand. Yeah, it does happen the, now the, and the, then. The, the deck's been been shuffled against me here a little bit. That's okay. I, I want to clarify that for our listeners. Yeah, you betcha. You see how badly we need your encouragement here. <laughs> no, I think but, this idea of a special revelation is a, is is an honest one, a fair one, and yet very difficult. Uh, people also have that with dreams. They, they have this, and, and uh, uh, these things aren't verifiable. And right. So, uh, so how to deal with that? I think that you just deal with them uh, cautiously, prayerfully, and uh, and ca with with great caution. Mm. The, 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 it's the Word of God that that matters. Yeah. Well, and that's what 2 Timothy 3.15 tells us. Study yes. to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, right. rightly dividing right. the Word. Rightly dividing. Yeah. And it's the Word of God which it really needs to be uh, the the measuring rule on our experience. And so if a person has something they believe to be true, they need to take that, test all things, hold fast sure. to that which is true. And so uh, really the the ultimate answer here is that when people are using uh, a very subjective way of finding out truth by saying, well, God's revealed this to me uh, through prayer, and somebody else says, well, God's revealed this to me through prayer, God, God, God's not the author of confusion. No. And therefore, if there is confusion there, it's uh, uh, either uh, either of the two or both are wrong, or they're using a method which God has not prescribed for us to discern what truth is. The truth is discerned through the Word of God as it's opened up by the Holy Spirit. That's and, how we know spiritual things. And the Lord is things. perfectly capable of confirming. Another thing, if it, if they're if they're persuaded a certain way, mm. the Lord can confirm that. But it'll be confirmed through the Word of God. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Okay. Question here from uh, Maria from Amsterdam. She writes: In the millennium, uh, there is a big new temple complex on Mount Zion. We will be re will we be reigning with Christ on earth? Will this new Jerusalem be hovering above the earth in the millennium and come down after? Will we be living in a new Jerusalem? I'm confused about its occurrence on the earth and what it exactly means. Can you help me out? No. <laughs> I would be indulging in, in uh, speculation. And I think one of the best things we can do when we get to something we don't know is just admit it uh, rather than contrive a speculation on a speculation kind mm. of thing. So, so my first reaction to that would be just caution. And, and, and double back and see what the scripture actually says. There's going to be a new Jerusalem, but exactly what it is. Uh, the reason I go at these things a little more cautiously is for another reason. Yep. Uh, I believe we're going to be dealing in more than a three-dimensional space. You and I are programmed uh, Euclidean geometry, yep. length, width, height. We think of three spatial dimensions, length, width, and height, and time is a fourth dimension. Uh, I have a number of reasons to be persuaded that what we're dealing with when you start talking about the New Jerusalem is additional dimensions. The minute you do that, you're moving in an area that uh, we, you need special training. There's only, there's no, the only kind of people that can really deal with hyperspace. Hyperspace is a space of more than three spatial dimensions. Right. And uh, uh, there's only two kinds of people that can deal with those. Mathematicians with special training and small children. <laughs> so, so I think the uh, 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 just I think there's a value in recognizing that there are hyperspaces, and our ability to deal with them is very very limited because of our limitations. Mm -hmm. And and uh, uh, that gets into a whole discussion of hyperspace. I don't want to derail this right, right, on, right. on that. But but uh, there's a whole area tutorially we get into, mm -hmm. but just recognize the minute you're starting to deal with hyperspaces, it takes a whole other uh, capability, uh, right. uh, perception. So. Right, right. All right. But during the millennium itself, there will be a Jerusalem. It's talked about in Ezekiel. Uh, there yes. will be a temple. And, yes, but and, I think, uh, but, but one of the reasons it's so mysterious to us 
because what's revealed doesn't seem to have coherence to us because we're dealing with hyperspaces, yeah. I believe. Yeah. And uh, but that's again a, a personal uh, perception. Right. And uh, and I'm I'm trying to resist the temptation to get into speculation because it's, it's I think it's okay to get into speculation with a limitation. Right. But uh, uh, but uh, it takes caution. Yes, right. And just don't be adamant about stuff that you can't absolutely know. Yeah, exactly. All righty. Let's move on to another question. This is from Joe. He says, I'd like to know if demons are fallen angels or disembodied spirits from the cohabitations of the angels to the women on the earth in Genesis. So, Cohabitation of the angels. Well, I think he just simply means the the Nephilim. The, the, the Nephilim. That's oh, what he's really okay. down to, yes. Okay. Um, the, the, the fact that there are, uh, the demons are not necessarily fallen angels is, a, I think there is a distinction between um, uh, uh, demons and fallen angels. Angels have the ability to materialize, and I think even the fallen ones also do. Mm -hmm. uh, demons do not. One of the, from the scripture we get the inference that the that um, uh, uh, there's a distinction. Now there are specialist scholars in demonology that do not agree with me. Right. But at the same time, uh, Unger, the Maryland Unger, there's, there's several that uh, are very competent and well established that would disagree with me. But uh, I hold the view that um, the demons uh, w seem to require co uh, 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 controlling us rather than. Emer emerging tangibly, yes. and, and uh, uh, that's a subject of a lot of folklore and traditions. But but I think from the scripture, that, that that's a, mm -hmm. that a, a mm -hmm. perception I've gained from the scripture. I, uh, it's a perception I have. I wouldn't. I don't want to oversell it, but I think it's. A, I think it's a place to not necessarily regard them as equivalents. Right. Yeah. If that's useful, right. uh, I think it's useful in the sense that if you can start getting into studying the Nephilim and all of that in Genesis six, it's worth studying carefully, on the one hand, uh, but with caution. Right, right, excellent. Well, we had a comment on YouTube uh, after a, a program a few weeks back. Uh, it's from Radovan, and so we're going to create some dialogue here back uh, to our YouTube audience. It says, if prophecy is used for authentication and is not for divination, predicting the future, why did Jesus give us the prophecy and told us to watch for it and imminence and all of that stuff? In other words, it does prophecy have a, uh, uh, does it play? Is it more than just for authentication? Is it also there to give us insight into what things will take place in the future? I think so, but not. I think there's a caution because divination is prohibited in the Torah. Yeah, it's not God's intention to reveal to us what's coming in that sense. He reveals it so that it authenticates him as the author when it happens. That's a form of authentication. It's that kind of authentication I think that's really mm -hmm. at issue here. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so uh, the, the whole doctrine of eminence being a good example of that. And so uh, uh, I would limit our our. Uh, study to what Jesus, in fact, communicated to us, not go beyond that. But I think that the distinction that divination is prohibited is, 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 wor is worthy of uh, caution. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the prophecy is not to, to give us the ability to predict the future, it's to, to uh, authenticate him as the author when we see it fulfilled. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. and as a th um, there are a number of techniques in cryptography that are just distinctive that way, that they're for authentication, not for predictive right. prediction. Yeah. Right. And so in the case of, of biblical prophecy, Jesus, for example, in, in um, Matthew 24, a very famous uh, passage, the Olivet Discourse, uh, you know, he's giving them uh, some things to look for. And he ends sort of with a parable of the fig tree, this idea when you see these things begin to come to pass look up for your redemption draws nigh. So we are given some indications uh, and things well, that we can that. look at. Uh, even more than that, I think. He has, I think, deliberately positioned us to live our lives in a moment-by-moment -moment expectation uh, of His return. Right. Uh, that's not a contrivance on our part. That's not some you know, fringe theory that is being promoted. No, I think that's what He clearly indicated us. 
and 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 uh, he, uh, even Paul lived his life that way, uh, with a sense of expectation, and so uh, I think that's uh, uh, and that's healthy to to live our lives in 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 that kind of expectation. That's mm -hmm. that, that's his intention. So I, I feel no uh, uh, appre apprehension doing what he said to do. Uh, that's what he, that was his intention. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, that leads to what we call the doctrine of eminence. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons, it's, it's useful in another way. There's a number of theories, uh, uh, eschatological theories, that are clearly wrong because they would require denying the doctrine of eminence. Yes. Uh, that's one reason we're not uh, post-trib and so forth, is because those things would re require denying the validity of the doctrine of eminence. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so uh, uh, I think we're on, on, on sound ground there by leaning in the direction Jesus is leading us to, which is to live our lives moment, in, a, in a moment by moment expectation. Mm -hmm. and, and we could crawl out on a limb here a little bit if you want, and that is we know from 2 Thessalonians 2 that the Antichrist cannot be revealed until after the rapture. Right. We don't know when the rapture is, but there are events that occur after the rapture that we can see on our horizon getting closer. Mm -hmm. Now, as we study those things, that's sort of wild because there are things on the horizon, and I won't get into it now, I'll let them get, do their homework to do what I'm suggesting here, mm -hmm. but there are world events that are going on that seem to be leading very, very close to the revealing of who the Antichrist is. Well, that will occur after the Harpazzo. Right. And if that's true, then the Harpazzo may be closer to us than we have any uh, imagination to grasp. It, mm -hmm. it, 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 mm -hmm. it may be very, very close. And uh, so I'll leave it with that so they can dig those things out from our materials. So and the use of that would be prophetically there, there, there is uh, the use of biblical prophecy that gives, a, gives us a perspective but it's when we try to take that perspective and give a concrete uh, prediction uh, yes. that, that uh, we're, we're going beyond the, the Word of God in that yes. sense and the use of prophecy but it becomes concrete once it's been fulfilled. Yes, exactly. All right. Getting Excellent. back to the divination thing, yes. Yes. But <coughs> at the same time, uh, there is a value, I think, to really doing some homework here. Uh, we, we say, you know, I love to put that thing where, you know, we're being plunged in a period of time about which the Bible says more than any other period of time in history. Mm -hmm. Well, to, to challenge that preposterous statement, and I encourage people to do that, they have to do two things. They have to find out what the Bible really says. Right. And that's pretty direct. But they also have to find out what's really going on. And what's really going on, the more you know what's really going on on the geopolitical scene, um, the more exciting it is. It confirms the convergence of what the Bible says and what's going on right. to imply elements, if you mm -hmm, will. Mm -hmm, absolutely. That's a question from Steve from Volcano, Hawaii. Sounds like he lives in a pretty dangerous place. <laughs> Volcano? Volcano, Hawaii. Is, okay. At least that's the address he gave us. So I hope he's not in the middle of a volcano. He says, we are in time and God is outside time. So then, we are between Genesis and Revelation. We're in the church age. And specifically, we are between the 69th week and the 70th week of Daniel. So what is next in your opinion? Isaiah 17.1. Uh, Psalm 83, Ezekiel 38, 39, the rapture of the church, or something else. In other words, he's saying, what, what are the events we should be looking for in a general sense, prophetically? All, all of those. All of those, actually. Um, so the uh, uh, Psalm 83 is perhaps uh, one of the most disturbing ones, because the verse 3 there speaks, it makes reference to uh, God having hidden treasured ones. What's it referring to? Right. And as you play with that and try to put it on different possibilities, uh, you, you, you can't escape the, poss the suggestion that that may be the raptured saints, that, 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 that that's describing 
a condition that's after the harpazo. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and if so, that, that, that makes that very imminent. Uh, uh, Isaiah 17.1, the Damascus thing, is uh, um, also a mystery in many ways as to, as to try to, f there isn't any clear linkage to how it fits in. Right. Uh, the Ezekiel 38, the Magog and all that, I think is pretty clearly uh, preceded by the Psalm 83. Thing. One would set up the other, your, your yeah, thoughts are. Yes, uh, th and that uh, Bill Salas and other scholars have highlighted that, and I think I tend to lean uh, in that direction too. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, uh, uh, the, the fact that the Harpazo, clearly though, I could argue that the next, if he's asking what's the next thing to happen, it is the Harpazo. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are some things that we know occur after the rapture that are increasingly near. Yes. Which means that the rapture itself may be closer than we suspect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it might be tomorrow. Let's wait. It could be before this program's over. Let's uh, see. That would be wonderful. It would be, it would be, <laughs> be live and on tape then. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next question. It says, uh, um, I was always curious if there is a difference between fallen angels and demons. We sort of have the same sort of a question before. Uh, if so, what are they and how does that affect what they do. This is Andrew from Australia. Well, the difference is that fallen angels can materialize. And, and, and uh, uh, apparently, there's a scripture to that. There's no uh, indication that demons can materialize. That seems to be a distinctive. But again, there are good scholars that would disagree. But uh, mm. that's, that's, the, that's the view we infer from our study of the word. Mm. Yeah, I don't know how to add to that. That's, mm. uh, well, certainly that's the case when you, when, if you limit yourself and most people who traffic in the area, especially of dealing with demons, uh, have a lot of extra biblical um, uh, experiences. Uh, the biblical narrative gives us the sense that, that demons require a host to express themselves. They don't speak out of rocks. They don't uh, uh, manifest themselves uh, independently of, of, of a host. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yet they do have the capability of, of causing the host to do some pretty extraordinary things. Yes, and, and so, but I think that distinction is, is, is in the scripture, and so I lean that way. That doesn't mean we're right. Yeah. That's, our, that's our perception, yeah. Good, good, all right. Clifford writes a question, he says, um, do you believe that there were other humans living on the earth before and during the time of Adam? Probably the context of this, you can see that there are some people that speculate out on the inter internet that, that Adam was not the only creation of God, uh, that uh, there were other humanoids Where do they, on the planet. Their, what's their basis for that? Their basis the, the Drake is equation? Just, they're probably <laughs> echoes of the, the Drake equation. <laughs> the Drake yeah. equation. Yeah, which is, the, which is the, for, the mathematical formulation of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Right. And when you go into that and study it carefully, it builds a formidable case of the uniqueness of, of the creation. Oh, yes. That includes Adam. Yeah. Um, and to go to a pre-Adamic presumption, uh, I, I would just raise the question, why? Uh, give me your evidence, uh, because there doesn't seem to be any scriptural evidence mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. um, if there isn't any scriptural evidence for that, the Drake equation is just a way of demonstrating how unique the creation itself is. And that gets into a whole discussion of the Drake equation, and I invite them to go ahead and explore that because yes. it's, very, it's a useful exercise. Yes, it is. But uh, um, do I believe there are other humans living on the earth before and during the time of Adam? I don't think, I think that, uh, I think the scripture clearly uh, um, sees Christ as the second Adam, so to speak. Yeah. And so uh, by uh, indulging in those speculations, they become uh, mechanisms to uh, diminish the completed work of Christ. Yes, there the, you go. The, com the, completed, the completeness of, of, uh, of Christ's fulfillment on our behalf mm -hmm. hangs on his uniqueness which in effect hangs on the uniqueness of Adam himself. Yes. So in, in that sense, I would reject that. Mm -hmm. And strangely enough, the Drake formula 
is a mathematical underscoring of exactly what we just said. Right, right. And you'll let the, uh, you can certainly uh, uh, Google that or do, a, yeah. or do a web search on that and you can see what some of the, the speculation, uh, mathematical speculation that was done uh, in the, uh, I guess it was the 50s and 60s, trying to determine yeah. what's the likelihood of life being elsewhere uh, in, uh, in the universe. Yeah, the Drake equation was a way of math putting into mathematics uh, the, the, the question. And, uh, you know, how, how many stars are there? How many of those stars have planets? Of how many of those planets can support life? And of those support life, and then it starts defining, it defines all the different pieces. Right. And to, to, to you, it turns out, you're just making reasonable guesses on some of those estimates, they compound. You're dealing with compounding uh, probabilities. Mm -hmm. And you, by the time you get out to the end, you're dealing with so many zeros, so to speak. Uh, it's so unlikely. It just becomes mathematically, it's a way of... Exp now, by the way, all of this violates what's called Borel's Law. In, in, um, pro in uh, composite probabilities, you have often a mathematical function that gets smaller and smaller and smaller. There's a point at which it becomes so small as to be discardable. Right. And uh, there's a need to, f to have a cutoff. And what's commonly accepted as the cutoff is called Borel's Law, and that's 10 with 50, zero, 50 zeros after it. Right. Something that is that unlikely is considered absurd. It's a defini mm -hmm. mathematical mm -hmm. definition of when is it, uh, 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 it is so improbable that it becomes by definition, absurd. Correct. It turns out that number has been accepted in scientific circles as 10 to the 50th. Well, by the time you go Drake, the Drake formula, you're way beyond 50. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as I recall, uh, um, our, our in blood, uh, um, the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. The, the, the hemoglobin. There's a, 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 a probability there that's 10 to the 650th. Right. You even encounter it. That it, can, that it can occur uh, yeah. by accident. By yes. accident, yeah, it's in, in, and so forth. So the point is that the, it, once you understand the formulation of Borel's Law, it's another way of just uh, of, uh, scratching, chasing zeros beyond 50 of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And there would be, you'd have to ask the simple biblical question, if there was another line of mankind that didn't flow from Adam, then they would not have necessarily been under the Adamic curse of sin. And that opens up another whole problem. So it's not even worth... Or they have, they're, they're under the curse and they have no redemption. Right. Well, that's even worse. <laughs> that's yeah, worse. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's right. Okay, um, Casey from Kansas City, Missouri writes, My question is related to God's command to Noah about receiving the animals on board the ark. What was the purpose of sending animals into the ark? Couldn't God just have created new animals after the flood like He did during the days of creation? Sure, He could have, He didn't. I never use why and God in the same sentence. I mean, He chose to do that. That's not the strangest thing He did, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the, the, uh, uh, he, he, uh, uh, that's what he did do. How do we know that? Because it tells us he did right. that. Yes. And uh, so, but God often seems to choose strange ways to accomplish his purpose. Mm -hmm. The most famous one being the brazen serpent. Mm. That he, uh, to, to, because of the, because of the serpents that were starting to bite the people, Moses prayed and God says, put a brass serpent on a pole and everybody that looks to that pole will be saved. And he does and they were. Right. But nowhere in the entire old Tanakh, in the Old Testament, can you find any discussion why did God use that rather weird emblem, take a, bra a serpent is, is a symbol of sin, to take a brass serpent on a pole, and if you look at that, you're going to be the beneficent, mm -hmm. benefit of the uh, redemption, uh, the salvation from that. And uh, 
You don't find out why God did that until you get to the New Testament in G uh, John chapter 3, verse 14, right. where uh, Jesus says, as Moses raised a, ser a serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be. And then you realize, mm. but when Jesus says that, that whole idea was God's anticipation of the cross. Right. And, and it was a, what we would call in, in, in literature a plant, a plot plant. Yep. That was an anticipatory sign planted in Numbers 21 that isn't explained until you get John 3, verse 14, which sets the stage for the most famous verse in the entire Bible, John 3:16. Right. So, so uh, I use that as just an example. You could make an interesting Bible study in a, a home group is to find other examples where God seems to go out of his way to do something in a weird way to make a point. Right. And I'll use that as my exemplar is show me some others of these, you know. Right, right. And it's also a that sense lead, of... That leads to another contest, oh, by the way. Yeah, if you have a on. home group, yeah. another contest you ought to have, I think, could, could easily be organized, is find other examples of anticipatory, des anticipatory designs in the scripture. Mm. Find things that are deliberately designed in advance. Now we collected a few of those. We call it treasures, uh, 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 hidden treasures. But there, there are others, and I think there are others still yet to be discovered. Mm -hmm. It's something you can do in your home Bible study: is find examples in the Scripture of evidences that it was designed in advance. Mm. before it yeah. was happening. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, uh, so for what it's worth. Yes, yes. And it's also the thing back to the, the why did God put animals on the ark? Uh, because the animals weren't, as, as a creation, weren't under judgment. They just simply were the sad benefactors of the sin of man. And uh, so God's not going to wipe them out because of uh, every, uh, that he began a creation and he will continue that until their purpose on this earth is finished. And uh, um, the there, idea may more, of, there may be more to it than that because God's most precious jealous God is a jealous God. There's yes. things He's mm -hmm. uh, uh, jealous of. Uh, he puts His word above everything. So, one of the things of, of His His uh, sensitivities, His number one sensitivity, is not God as the Redeemer because you need the Word of God to understand mm -hmm. His redemption. His number one jealousy is as creator. Yes. And, and he makes that point himself and, and uh, that, he, he, that he says the creation itself bears witness enough to hold us accountable. Right. And so that's why the, the fact that those animals were unique creations in the first place mm -hmm. is part of the underscoring of his role as creator. Right. And uh, uh, from there you get into, you can get into the discussion of insects and the, the animals that probably may not have been on the ark, but they did survive somehow. Anyway, right, right. go another way. <laughs> okay. All right. Jen from Chico, California writes, in Job 14, 13, it says, Oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past. She asked the question, could this be a prophetic reference to a pre-trib rapture? Well, I don't see why not. That's interesting. That's a fourth one. I found three other Old Testament references to the rapture. Mm -hmm. That's a fourth one. Well, she might have pointed she, something yeah, out as a, a discovery. I hadn't seen, I hadn't, I'd, I'd go double back on that because that is, I would believe, a, a, an allusion to the rapture in the Old Testament. Right. And now that makes four, I found. Well, there you go. That, and, and, there, and, and given to us by one of our, our uh, YouTube audiences. Yeah, this uh, is what, comes what, to us, Jen from Chico. From Chico. Well, thank you. That's a... And for us, that's a discovery. Yeah, there you go. Ec excellent. Okay, Chris writes regarding the plans for the third temple. He says, in the Torah, Moses received blueprints from God for the tabernacle, and all went with it. David apparently received from God blueprints on how to build the temple, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verses 10 to 21. How will they know how to build the temple yet to come in the 70th week of Daniel? From the Scripture. From the Tanakh and from the, Mish the Mishnah and the, the various uh, uh, sources that are in hand already. 
And there are people that spend their lives studying those very, very carefully. That's what they do in yeshivas and in, in uh, Israel. Well, we certainly have, have been connected for years with the Temple Institute and lots of sure. other organizations Although dedicated. be careful, I think the Temple Institute itself has gone a little new agey, by the way. Right. But, uh, well, that was the point I was going to make, yeah. is that they, they are using uh, what they believe are divinely inspired direction for this, what we call the Third Temple. Um, but the real question is, uh, and it might echo a little bit what Chris is bringing out here, is the sense that, is this a temple? With the tabernacle, we know God dwelt within it. With the, the temple, we know that certainly God's presence was there at its inception. But, it, but then it departed. Correct. The real question that might go along with this is, is this third temple a, a, uh, a place where God's presence is going to dwell? Uh, I think it's going to be clouded by the fact that it's all, its destiny is to be uh, uh, aborted by the, uh, the Antichrist. That's what 2 Thessalonians 2 focuses on so intensely. And so uh, I would be cautious there about what we mean by the third you know, temple. So, and mm -hmm. the, that, that's the one that the Antichrist will uh, uh, invade, violate. He'll right. violate his, his, uh, his, his uh, Affirmation. Right. And that's so I can segue into another thing that we've talked about here a number of times, uh, and that is within the last two years, a lot of the discovery in the city of David, Bob Cranuk and others have, uh, have sort of been pointing, first of all, the city of David, where the, the temple was not located up on what we know as the Temple Mount. They know, they believe that that's now the Antonio Fortress, yes, which I, would mean I, I, the city of David would be the location. Uh, not just of the palaces of David and the city of Zion, but also the temple itself, which opens up a real opportunity, doesn't it? Very much so. Very, and that's, one, that's why there's such a dilemma going on in Israel right now, is <clears throat> on the one hand, they're having a tough time adjusting to the discoveries that the, what we call the temple, what's traditionally been called the Temple Mount is actually the, Anto that whole thing was the Antonia Fortress, and that it's at a lower elevation to the south that... Uh, South, or yes. West, or, yeah, yeah, south. Yeah, south. Uh, um, that is the, the 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 area that was Zion has been plowed under, and so it it, it is it has disappeared and it's being rediscovered in a sense mm -hmm. by getting under it, if you will. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, in fact, not only uh, going back uh, to uh, uh, Solomon, but to go back to Melchizedek, and uh, that that that's staggering in its implications. Let's move to another question here. It's from Scott. He says, in Matthew chapter 25, there are 10 virgins. Are the five that did not have enough oil non-Christians who miss out heaven? Or are they Christians who miss the rapture? Or are they Christians who miss out on some other blessing or reward? Which, or is there a fourth category? Uh, mm -hmm. So wh who are the five in, the, in this Matthew 25 example of this, uh, these virgins waiting for the bridegroom? Um, five uh, have, have oil in their lamps, and when the bridegroom comes, they go in. The five that don't uh, are desperate, and they're left outside. Are they non-believers? Are they Christians who miss the rapture, or are they missing out some other way? And the, uh, the, the answer to that is I don't know. I can speculate like many people have. Um, I think the, the issue really, strangely enough, um, is hinted at in uh, the Old Testament uh, in terms of the uh, 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 that um, when he goes to visit Laban, he takes ten camels. Ten camels, which tells me that was a wedding party, and so uh, um, I think what's at issue there, if if that linkage is valid, that's a big if, but if it is then what we're dealing with here is a wedding party. And that raises the issue of the bride of Christ in contrast to the body of Christ. Right. And that's one of the reasons that I personally suspect, I don't know, but I suspect that the bride of Christ is a favored subset of what we would embrace by the term body of Christ. Right. That in, it includes a favored subset that, we, that is the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then uh, that would be, that would, this would be pointing to that distinctive. Um, but this whole thing raises that issue. Is the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, are these synonymous? 
most scholars would treat it as if they are. I suspect that they're not, that the Bride of Christ is a favored subset, mm -hmm. that there are people that uh, may not be part of that wedding party, but they're still saved. Right. And they right. will be favorably resurrected, yes. Right. And it could play into a, maybe an allusion to the judgment seat of Christ and all sure. kinds of different things in terms of their, their fruit bearing. Linda asks a question. She says, the common belief is that an individual's prayers are not as powerful as a group or a community of people's prayers. Is this true? If so, why? Why are a group of uh, church prayer warriors or a prayer chain praying for a person considered more effective uh, is this faulty thinking? And so the idea of, is it the amount of people praying? Is there, is there, a, is there something that's a, a constant here that we can say with regards to prayer? No, there seems to be an indication in the scripture of that there's a value in collecting t together where two or three are gathered on in the midst of them. And so you mean with one he's not? No, that's not what he's saying. But where there's mm -hmm. where two or three together, there's a... Um, uh, it, 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 God is willing to have us gathered to get his attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't see that as a, a limitation. I see it as an opportunity. And uh, I think what it's pointing to is the opportunity. And so I think there's a value in collecting together for prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems to be encouraged in the scripture. And I will I'll lean on that. Does that mean that there's a minimum number? I don't think so. Mm. But, he, but he does say where two or three are gathered, and I would assume that four, that would also hold for four or five. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> okay. right. Uh, that uh, God will favor that. And uh, uh, I think he's glad to see us gather for prayer. That pleases him. Right. That's what I think, that's what I'm hearing him say. Right, right. And it's the old uh, sort of saying that people use, uh, a, a, a problem shared is a problem halved. Uh, in the sense of, uh, as, you, as you distribute the sense of your, uh, your need or desire and you begin to share it with more people and they begin to, to um, lift you up before the Lord, uh, there's just more people interceding on your behalf. With well, I find, to I find that through almost every day. Yes. Because I walk from my, my home down the runway at River Lodge mm -hmm. to the lodge. Yeah. That's about 600 meters. Yep. And... Uh, it's not perfectly, it, you know, the runway itself is smooth and I try not to walk on the runway unless it's going to be used by a plane, so I stay on the edge of it. Yes. And uh, so I, I've discovered, and I, I walk with a cane because it helps me. Yeah. And I've discovered it's half as far if I have two canes. <laughs> That, that's got to be fourth dimensional math, Chuck. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they're all wondering what on earth am I talking about here. With two kings, it's, it's half as far. Yeah. Uh, but we do know this about prayer. James tells us the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. He, re yes. he refers to Elijah who was, didn't ask for a prayer meeting uh, to accomplish what God was doing. Uh, God, he was praying in concert with God's will. And, and uh, man doesn't make... Uh, things happen through his prayer. He's just simply agreeing with what God's he doing. He makes reference of a widow that becomes a nuisance, so God will answer to stop her from bothering him. <laughs> he, the, you know. An interesting prayer life. All right. Um, uh, Daniel from Maple Ridge, uh, British Columbia, writes, As we fully know and understand, just prior to the return of Christ, God will pour out his wrath one final time upon the whole earth. Does the Bible clearly tell and or describe for us how long he will actually take to do this. Hmm. This time of the wrath of God. Is there a specific period of time that this wrath will take place? Well, the problem is, is it the final one? Because clearly there's a pouring out what they call the Great Tribulation. Mm -hmm. Jesus himself, this tribulation is not seven years. The 70th week of Daniel is seven years. But in the middle of the seven years, there's an event that occurred that's called the abomination of desolation. And it's the Lord Jesus himself that points out that the great tribulation is, is not seven years, it's the last three and a half of those years. Mm -hmm. And so that particular period, he himself labels as the great tribulation. The question that this is begging though, is that the final one? I don't know. 
because there may be an ultimate thing even later after, before the, you're the great white Jonas. So uh, um, that's the question. Is it? Uh, um, well, certainly, we know that there's. Which one's this the final one? Is a question I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I, I could be dogmatic on that. All right. Ben writes. This is the. He says some teach that the Bible says that a sign of being saved is speaking in tongues. I don't believe that. Well, that's your answer. Yeah, I don't believe that. Uh, that's commonly taught by some enthusiasts, uh, but uh, the Holy Spirit in in what we know about tongues is in two chapters, chapter 11 and chapter 14 of uh, 1 Corinthians. And what's interesting in second, I think it's in uh, uh, 14, the Holy Spirit gives gifts variably as He will. And that implies that not everybody speaks in tongues. Yes. He gives different gifts is the first point. And uh, so the, the sign of uh, being saved is speaking in tongues. No, I don't think that's true. There are different tongues. And Walter Martin, who did speak in tongues, by the way, but Walter Martin used to have great fun with these people because he went early in his ministry. There was an incident occur in New Guinea where a, a, girl, a young lady, a young gal was raised from the dead and it was published in the papers and so forth. And Walter used to lean on that. He would, when people would talk about gifts, he says, he would turn to them and says, have you got the gift of raising of the dead? And when the person would say no, he would look crestfallen. And then he'd say, oh, I'll pray for you. So right, you might right. enter. And he would start feeding him that line. Right. And it took him a while to realize he was just being sarcastic, putting the needle in. To make any one gift above another is unscriptural. Right. And for people who get so enthusiastic about supporting tongues, there's two errors about tongues. One is to say that they're not for today. That's mm -hmm. not true. Mm -hmm. And others that say that they, you know, that they don't exist today. Either one is incorrect, yeah, yeah, so to yeah. speak. Mm -hmm. And the, the error comes about by insisting that that's somehow a unique uh, sign of saying, No, it's a, it's a unique gift that's given occasionally, and apparently still is, strangely enough. Yes. Much to the surprise of many. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, 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 the, the 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 gift that is there, even in, and, and and Peter. Describes it that this is that which Joel talked about that it started. Well, he's it didn't end; it continued. Is the point? So anyway, um, mm -hmm. all right. Let's move on to one last question here before we come to the end of our hour. Uh, this is a this is a tough one to, to give you at the very end, but uh, uh, it's from Lester. He writes. The husband of one wife clause found in 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses, uh, verse 2 and Titus 1 6 has been the subject of controversy for many years. I know polygamy is not permitted and I know the death of a spouse does not disqualify a man from ministry based on Romans chapter 7 verses 2 and 3. My question is, can a man who has gone through two divorces and is married for a third time, having repented and tempted biblical recon reconciliation in both cases resulting in failure, be a minister or be a music minister, an evangelist or a pastor uh, or pastor a church ever again. What are your thoughts there? Well, is the, is the injunction for being an elder or being in the ministry? It's my first question. I have to look at the context. Um, uh, he might be, be precluded. It, it's possible, I have to check, that uh, he may be precluded from being an elder that doesn't keep him out of the ministry. So I, that, that's a bridge I haven't crossed with him. Does that make sense? Yes, I think it absolutely does. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a simple way to get across the idea that, that we're the ones that classify sin. Uh, the, the, the direction that Paul gives Timothy uh, and Titus with regards to the requirements for those who would be overseers, um, if we applied equal um, emphasis on all the clarifications, um, we, would, we would have no one in pulpits today. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, true. when you go through and it says, you know, is he, is he uh, um, a blameless is the first one, uh, the husband of one wife, and so on and so forth. You begin to go down that. If you give each one of those the same disqualifying capability uh -huh. as that of a, a man who uh, has perhaps uh, experienced what this, uh, uh, what Lester is referring to, uh, then we would have to just about disqualify everyone. Certainly, you disqualify uh, people like David, uh, 
Uh, he was more, had more than one wife. Uh -huh. He was guilty of murder. He was guilty of adultery. And yet um, God was still able to use him. That's not an excuse. Uh, it does uh, injure your capability to minister, I think. But nonetheless, I think that it's um, something that God is the only one who will qualify or disqualify a person, I think. Well, again, we thank you very much for tuning in and joining us. Again, I encourage you uh, to, if you haven't already, become a subscriber to this YouTube channel. It just allows us to be able to send you notices when, uh, when and as soon as we are posting the videos. Or if you're uh, a member of uh, Facebook or Twitter, uh, join our uh, Facebook or Twitter accounts so that we can, again, keep you abreast of what's taking place. Uh, and we can uh, enjoy your feedback and take, uh, take input back from you. So appreciate you taking the time to be with us. May God bless you as you continue to study His Word. God bless.